Whenever we worship and whenever I speak, I seek to speak from the Bible. Why? Why do we trust the Bible? And today I want to reflect on just some basic questions about the Bible, some frequently asked questions. Why was the Bible written? Who authored the Bible? When was the Bible written? Which books belong in the Bible, and how did they decide which books went in and which ones were left out? How do we know the Bible is true? Where else besides the Bible might we find final truth, absolute truth? And what changes if we trust the Bible? Those are some of the questions that we're going to be exploring today, and to help us with that, let's begin with what the Bible says about itself, because that can be very helpful. And two of the key passages that speak in very brief but very powerful ways about the purpose of the Bible are from 1 Peter and from 2 Timothy. 1 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. No prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And then from 2 Timothy chapter 3, As for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So when we ask, why was the Bible written? Those verses give us an excellent explanation. One reason the Bible is written and the main reason, in many ways, is simply to reveal God in Christ. We cannot know God as he wants to be known simply by looking at other things he has done. Because the creation he has made, though it speaks of God and of his beauty and of his power and splendor, has also been affected by sin and by brokenness. And our own hearts have been affected by sin and brokenness. So we're not always very good at getting the message of creation. And we also are not going to get the full message of God's character, his righteousness, and of his salvation in Jesus Christ. So the Bible is given mainly to show us who God is and how he has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. That's important to know because we need to know what the focus or purpose is. When we read the Bible, the main question we should always be asking is, what's it telling us about God? What's it telling us about Jesus and his purposes in Christ? And in some passages, we might not see that right away. And sometimes it's okay to leave aside a passage that we don't grasp for a while and go to the ones that are a little more obvious to show us what God is saying about Christ and who he is. And so... If you want to know Jesus, it is absolutely vital that you listen to the Bible because that is the purpose of the Bible and that's the only source that you can be sure of when you're hearing about Jesus. It makes us wise um, in relation to Jesus Christ and in particular, it makes us wise for salvation through Jesus Christ according to the scripture itself. It makes us wise for salvation. What is salvation? It is to be rescued from sin and death. It's to be rescued from the sin and from the guilt and from the punishment that we get because we fall short of the glory of God and we go against God. And the only way to be forgiven for that is through Jesus and through his blood through his death on the cross to pay the penalty of our sin, and through his rising again to give eternal life. The scriptures are written to tell us mainly about Jesus and in particular about his death and resurrection and all that he did for our salvation so that instead of being lost and damned in hell, we would be forgiven and saved and given eternal life 
in Jesus Christ. It's the book that gives life because it points us to the Christ who gives life. And without him, there's only death. The Bible is given so that we could be saved for eternity by hearing the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And then having revealed God in Christ, And having shown us how we can be right with God and live forever, the Bible also shows us how we can be good. You say, well, doesn't everybody know that? No, we don't. Um, There's a lot of different opinions about what goodness is and about what a good life is. And the good life in both senses. One, sometimes when we talk about the good life, we mean flourishing. We mean Uh, experiencing life as we really want to. But another sense of the good life is how do you live a good life by being a good person? So what is it to have a good life in terms of flourishing? What is it to be a good person? The Bible gives us instruction on what pleases God, what doesn't. Instruction on what's going to make you flourish and what's going to really wreck your life. And so The Bible is written for that purpose. So the Bible says it rebukes, you know, it teaches. It rebukes, which means here's where you're going going off the tracks. It corrects, gets you back on the tracks again, and and gives you training. And so those are great purposes of the Bible, to reveal God in Christ, to get us saved, and then to help us to know what a good life is and to live that good life. Well, who authored the Bible? Well, there's a double authorship to the Bible. The main thing to know is that God's Spirit authored the Bible. All Scripture is God-breathed, theopneustos, uh, uh, breathed out or spirited out by God. It comes to us from God. Um, That's what the Apostle Paul tells us. The Apostle Peter, as we've just heard, says that men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the primary author of the Bible is the Holy Spirit of God who gives us what God wants us to know. But there's also a lot of different authors, people who are authors. And they're the ones who are carried along by the Holy Spirit to write down what's in those books. The Bible is divine and at the same time it's human. God comes to us in human words with stories that happened in human lives Uh, with very human problems being addressed and and God's message for humanity. It's a human book, but it comes from God, and we bless God for both of those things. We're thankful to God that he gave this book and inspired it, directed its writing, carried along those writers, because then we can have confidence, because God doesn't lie. If the book comes from God and its content comes from God, It's going to come to us without fooling us, without making mistakes. And at the same time, it's going to come to us not as something so far distant as uh, if God were not to speak in human language and in a sense to talk baby. The Bible in some ways is baby talk. God is talking at our level. And he does it so we can know him to the degree that we're able So we have that double authorship of God's spirit and of human writers. Well, when was the Bible written? The first thing that we know of that was written down in the Bible was written in 1446 B.C. It was not even written. That one wasn't even written by a human author. I said a moment ago that there's a double authorship, but it was first written by the finger of God in stone. The Ten Commandments. The Bible tells us that the Ten Commandments were written by the finger of God in stone. And that was written in 1446, the year of the Exodus, when God brought the Israelites to Mount Sinai. Now, that's not the first thing that you read about in the Bible. I'm just saying that's the first thing that got written down that is now in the Bible is, is the Ten Commandments. But those first books of the Bible were written by Moses, um, recording what God told him. Um, Not just what was written by the finger of God in stone, but many other things that God told him or showed him or guided him to write. And so Moses lived at that time, but that does not mean the Bible starts with Moses. Those of you who have read the Bible know there's a a whole book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, that predates Moses. It wasn't written down before that time. It may have been written in certain form. We don't know. We know that it was written 
as part of the writings of Moses. But it looks back and back and back. It looks back to the time of Abraham 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years before Jesus. It looks even further back to the Tower of Babel, further back to the flood that covered the earth, and further back to the creation of the world. So the Bible covers events from the very beginning, but the first books were written um, somewhere after 1446 B.C. The last book, the book of Revelation, was written in 95 or maybe 96 A.D. A.D. means Anno Domini, year of our Lord. And so that's the last book of the Bible. So there's a whole bunch of books that are written in that period of about 1,500 years that God inspires people to write down. Which books belong in it? That's a question that, that sometimes I hear from people. How did, how did some books make it into the Bible and other books get left out of the Bible? When we look at the Bible in its current form, we have 66 books, 39 in the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, and 27 in, written in Greek, what we call the New Testament, written after the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how did those books become part of the Bible and other books not become part of the Bible? Well, the 39 Old Testament books made it into the Bible because God had spoken to these people and because they were recognized as messages from God. One way it was recognized and other things were left out was because what they said came true. You know, when, when Isaiah writes down prophecies and then they happen just like he said they would, people say, hmm, wonder how he did that. You know, they, they weren't wondering how he did that. They knew how he did that. There were some prophets who were very unpopular in their time. Most people didn't listen to them. But you know what? The old saying, hindsight is 2020. You hang around to 50, 100 years later and you say, wow, those writers understood what was going on. And they spoke of the future in ways that were accurate as well. See, prophecy has both of those things. We think of prophecy often as predicting what's going to happen, and it is pretty impressive when somebody predicts in advance what's going to happen, and then it does happen. But it's also hard to know what's going on right now. You say, well, duh, anybody knows that. Oh, yeah? Then why do people fight like crazy over politics? Why do family members fight like crazy sometimes over who's to blame for this or that? It's very hard to know what's going on right now, what's really going on. If you even understood yourself perfectly, you wouldn't have half the problems you do. We have a hard time knowing what's going on right now. And a prophet is someone with a vision from God to see what's happening now and to help other people see it too. So the, those books have that unique character of helping you to understand yourself and understand the times you're living in as well as looking into the future and telling you things that are going to happen. When Jeremiah was prophesying, for instance, um, he said that Jerusalem was going to fall. Jerusalem had stood for centuries and had not been conquered. And a lot of the other prophets said, smile, God's on your side, his temple's in Jerusalem, nothing bad could possibly happen. Well, you know, when the temple is burned down and the walls of Jerusalem are broken down, then people say, you know, I, I think that Jeremiah guy might have been onto something. And those other prophets, I, I don't think we're going to keep their writings because they saw the failure of many. And so uh, a big part of what made it into the Old Testament was simply that some people told the truth and the truth came out and others didn't tell the truth and that those books were dropped. Now there's a section of the Bible called the Apocrypha in some Bibles, but not in many other Bibles. The Hebrew Bible never included the Apocrypha. It's a number of books that were written between 400 years before Jesus and the time of Jesus. And in some Catholic Bibles, you'll find the Apocrypha and in some other editions of the Bible. Now, does the Apocrypha belong as part of the Word of God? That's the question. And the Jewish people never accepted the Apocrypha as the Word of God. It was never part of the Hebrew Bible. The early Christians did not accept it as part of the Word of God. It was not part of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and, and the Christians who recognized the Hebrew Bible knew that the Apocrypha, those books didn't belong in it. 
Later on, around the time of the Reformation, there was some bickering, and of course, once you get in a fight, if one side says this, then the other side says, no, no, it's that. So when the Protestants and the Catholics disagreed sharply over a variety of things, where previously the Apocrypha had not been insisted on as Scripture, suddenly it's Scripture because Protestants said it wasn't. Um, so there was a little bit of that dynamic of just fighting over what belonged in. Now, the Protestants who were looking at the Apocrypha did not say, these books are horrible, they are wicked, they are bad. Most of them said, you know, most of what's in these books is excellent. And it's very, some of it's very helpful history, other of it has very good spiritual insight, but it doesn't belong in the Bible because it was never accepted as part of the Hebrew Bible. There's a big difference. I'll, I'll give you an example. When you look at the Old Testament books, you'll find that they are quoted again and again and again and again by Jesus and by the other New Testament writers. There's not a single quote from the Apocrypha in the entire New Testament. That maybe ought to give us a little clue about what standing the Apocrypha had in the mind of Jesus and in the mind of the New Testament authors. So, uh, again, that is not to bash those books as being useless. There's a lot of good Christian books today that are worth reading. They're just not part of the Bible. They are not without error and they're not directly from God. And then when it came to the New Testament books, there's 27 of them, and they were recognized, most of them, almost immediately by the early church. The writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four gospel accounts were accepted very early, and so were the letters of Paul, letters by John and Peter who were um, apostles. And the main criterion, the main standard was simply, is this apostolic? Is it linked to apostles of Jesus Christ? Because Jesus chose apostles to be eyewitnesses of what he taught and what he did and of his resurrection. They were all people who had seen him alive after his resurrection. And so, uh, a writing, no matter how good, wasn't even considered if it wasn't from one of those witnesses or from a very close associate who was writing on the basis of what the witness told them. So, for example, you have Matthew and John. Those accounts of Jesus are written by Matthew, who was a follower, one of the twelve disciples, and John, who was one of the twelve disciples. Mark and his mother were part of the Christian group from a very early time, and Mark was a very close associate of both Paul, and of Peter. And the book of Mark, according to early church history, was written as Mark writing down what Peter told him uh, when they were both in Rome. Luke was a very close associate of the Apostle Paul. In fact, you start reading the Gospel of Luke, and then when you get to the book of Acts, partway through the book of Acts, all of a sudden it's saying we, because Luke is part of the traveling company with the Apostle Paul. He's a doctor, Luke is. And so Luke wrote those things down because he had a very close association with Paul. And Paul was an eyewitness who had seen Jesus rise from the dead and had been called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. So something made it into the New Testament if it had that firsthand, uh, that firsthand sourcing. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty is how the apostle Peter puts it in 1 Peter 1 verse 16. The Apostle John says in 1 John 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, and we've seen it, and we testify to it. That was the flavor of the New Testament witness. Now, there were a few books that weren't accepted by all the churches right away, partly because some of them were in one area of the Christian world, but not yet in another area of the Christian world. Keep in mind, what we have as the Bible, the word Bible, by the way, just means book. Um, it's the book of books. It has a lot of different books in it. And so these were circulating as separate books for quite a while, but widely recognized as belonging um, to the word of God as his witness. And so there were um, Jude, James were not accepted immediately. But again, Jude and James were not directly apostles right away. They had the qualification of being Jesus' half-brothers and who had seen him after his resurrection and had grown up with him. So they weren't exactly strangers. 
they were people who also wrote um, New Testament books. And the book of Hebrews uh, was thought to have been written by Paul. It might not have been written by Paul. It might have been written by a very close associate of Paul, such as Barnabas or Apollos. But it was recognized that this book just sounds consistent with and has that, that authority that comes from being the Word of God. And so you had these various uh, books of the New Testament known to be written by an apostle or by a very close associate. Now, I'll take an example from the book of Luke. He was a very close associate of, of Paul, but then he tells us how he went about it. He says, I also checked in with some other people who were there. And so you have some of his, the early chapters seem to be obviously from consulting um, Jesus' mother Mary. Uh, and you have other uh, aspects of Luke that, that come from him gathering the eyewitnesses into one book. So which books belong? The ones that were written by the eyewitnesses. The ones that didn't belong were the ones that were cooked up later. And, and there's a variety. Some were very excellent books. Uh, I've read some of those early Christian books that were written in the second century, and some of them are just wonderful books, but they weren't written by the eyewitnesses. There's others that are, you know, they're, they're pious. They have mostly good stuff about Jesus, but you can tell there's stuff that's made up. I mean, you can tell it the moment you read it. I'll give you an example. There's one of those early books that has a story about Jesus when he's little. And wouldn't we all like to hear what Jesus was like when he was little and get a few more stories from when he was a kid? Well, in this particular one, Jesus makes some birds out of clay. And, you know, a little kid, they like what they've just made, the little toy. And then some mean kids come along and they start picking on him and they're going to smash those birds he made out of clay. So Jesus claps his hands and the birds fly away. Now, wouldn't you love to do that when a bully comes after you? There's another version of that story where um, the little kid has those mean little kids struck dead. You know, there's a few little kids who might like to do that too. But, you know, you read that story and you say, nah, you know, that, that was a good tale, but come on. Uh, that was not part of the early witness that God wanted us to know, and it's contrary to what we know about Jesus. So, um, you know, what... One short answer is which books belong, really, read them, and you'll right away see a difference in the quality of, you know, of the inspired books versus the ones that weren't. Well, how do we know the Bible's true? Well, first of all, simply because God is the author, but if you um, doubt that or doubt particular books, it's worth asking, well, how do we know it's true? Jesus himself maybe is a place to start. Jesus said scripture cannot be broken. Jesus, um, I mentioned earlier that the Bible is mainly about Jesus and salvation through Jesus. And Jesus said they all point to me. So if we are people who take Jesus Christ seriously at all, then we should take the Bible as seriously as Jesus took it. Another reason that, that supports confidence in the Bible's truth is the fact that it made so many accurate predictions. I've got whole sermons about that, so I can't give them here now. But when you read things written a thousand years before Jesus that say they've pierced my hands and my feet, and, and I'm thirsty, and my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, when you read of somebody suffering in place of others, and then after all that he sees the light of life and is satisfied. When you read predictions of his death and his suffering and of his resurrection. When you read of a king riding into Jerusalem on a donkey while people are shouting Hosanna. Uh, you know, those are things that are written hundreds, uh, you know, and even um, a thousand years before Jesus actually came. And, and when something is predicted long in advance and then it comes true in somebody's life, in one life, a whole bunch of stuff comes rushing together, you say, that is a special person and that is a special book. Another um, supporting a line of evidence for taking the Bible seriously, though not a line of evidence that is as reliable as the Bible itself, of course, is archaeology. Uh, you know, a few examples, there are many, many examples, you know, of archaeology corroborating um, historical characters and details. And sometimes that comes in handy because we live in a time when people doubt everything. You know, it's fashionable a hundred or so years ago to doubt whether Jesus Christ even existed whether somebody named Jesus of Nazareth even existed, let alone did the mighty miracles and all of that. You know, that, that pretty well has fallen out of favor again. It, it's hard to deny. But you also have um, 
people who would doubt, for instance, that King David ever existed. You say, well, how could they doubt that? Well, it's simple. Uh, he wasn't mentioned anywhere but the Bible, so the Bible must be making all this up. Well, this is a strange little thing about archaeology. Imagine 2,000 years from now, how much evidence of you is going to be left? How much evidence of most of the governments of the world is going to be left? You know, artifacts, probably not very much. But having said all that, the, every, you never know what those archaeologists are going to dig up, and sometimes it's very inconvenient for skeptics. They're digging around, they find uh, something from another nation, and it refers to Israel as House of David. Oopsie daisy. Maybe he did exist. Um, and, you know, and there's, there's David inscriptions, a couple of them now have been found etched in stone. Uh, the doubts about Jesus and the details of his life, they say, we never heard of any Roman ruler named Pontius Pilate. <laughs> Come on, there's no proof the guy ever existed. And then a stone gets dug up, and it is a stone dedicating a building to Tiberius Caesar in the name of Pontius Pilate. Oh, the, the last couple letters are missing. Uh, you know, it would you know, it'd be Pontius Pilatus if you had the whole name. Oh, boy, it sure sounds like there was a Pontius Pilate around. You know, in the, so archaeology can't teach you that Jesus is the Son of God or the deep mysteries of the Trinity. Uh, but it can tell you that Pontius Pilate was around. It can tell you that David was there. Uh, there another example that has always um, amused me it was people who doubted that John, the author of the fourth gospel, had ever li lived in Jerusalem or in Israel and they just cooked it all up. And he refers, for example, um, to a pool with a porch of five pillars. And they said, oh, come on, that just there's no such thing. Uh, just proves he'd never been there. And then those inconvenient archaeologists dug up this thing that was exactly as John had described it. And you think, I wonder, you know, if the guy who was there maybe knew what Jerusalem was like at the time better than people 2,000 years ago trying to guess what it was like. You've got to understand, that's what scholarship is now, trying to piece together with little clues. If you're going to doubt the documents, then you're always just trying to piece together things from a, a few artifacts, and that's very, very hard to do. You've got to accept writings if you want to accept anything. There's also manuscript evidence. And, and, of course, that doesn't prove that manuscripts are true, but if you don't have any manuscripts at all that are ancient, then you might question how accurately the books were transmitted from one generation to another to another. Let us begin by observing that there are, I believe, seven manuscripts of Plato um, remaining in existence from, you know, from within many centuries after him. Um, about 5,700 um, first-hand manuscripts or parts of manuscripts, you know, from the New Testament and, and from the Old Testament. So the, the amount of manuscripts that you have to work with in piecing together the original text is very much greater. Uh, if you were to be as hard on other writings as you are on Bible writings, you would not know anything or believe anything. There would be no, Julius Caesar never existed. Um, the Roman Empire um, didn't exist. Uh, you know, Alexander the Great. If you're gonna, if you're gonna dismiss all of the things that got written down back then, you're not gonna have anything left. And so, at the very least, we, you know, you could. There's books, entire books, and then there's a whole area called textual criticism, which pieces together what the Bible said from those original texts. But uh, the point again is there is a greater level of accuracy and of, of manuscript evidence that we have than for any other historical writings of the ancient world. It's also um, just worth pointing out when it comes uh, to those manuscripts that, that God was the source of the original writings and that when we doubt whether they were copied accurately, a lot of time, you know, copying stuff by hand, you know what it's like to type a copy. You're going to have mistakes on every page. Um, and when you write it down, there's little glitches where you misspelled something or you wrote the instead of that. It just happens. And you have that kind of thing in the copying of the manuscripts too. But it's very easy to compare them and say, there, that was a typo. You, know, you don't do typos without typewriters and computers, but the same thing, that was a righto. 
um, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call that. Um, you, you, it, it's very easy. And so when you, when you compare things with greater than 99% accuracy, you can know what the original text was. And we also have it, you know, take, let's take the Old Testament um, part of the Bible. There was a great discovery in the late 1940s where a shepherd was out wandering around um, in the desert near an area called Qumran. And uh, according to the story, he just chucked a stone at, uh, at a hole, you know, a cave, and he heard something break. And he went in and found all kinds of jars, clay jars, that had uh, scrolls and manuscripts in them. And those became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there was an entire scroll of Isaiah. And that scroll is so valuable. I remember when I was in Israel, I went into a place that showed the Isaiah scroll all spread out, and they had it at perfect room temperature, you know, the, and everything was controlled, and it was behind glass and sealed. And that was the copy. <laughs> that was how they treated the copy. Uh, but but the, the original of, of Isaiah dated from before the time of Christ, and it almost perfectly matched the texts that we've had of Isaiah that were passed down through the years. And you could continue, you know, I won't get into all the other examples, except to say that just from kind of physical evidence and research of archaeology and manuscripts, we know that the Bible was transmitted from century to century with a high degree of reliability. And having said all that, um, that's not the most important reason to believe the Bible. Most important to believe the Bible is, to be, is because our Lord Jesus Christ said Scripture cannot be broken. <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, there's a lot of different authorities saying stuff. Uh, Jesus said Scripture cannot be broken. And when you read the Bible, there is something that happens to some people at least, to many, many people over the centuries, that when they read it, it, is, it starts to shine with its own light. And a light goes on inside you. And the Bible... Uh, speaks of God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The, that's called the Spirit's inner testimony, the illumination of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who inspired the Bible to be written also works in your heart to recognize that it's true and powerful and shining light into your heart and shining light onto your path. Where else is final truth besides the Bible? The short answer is nowhere. That doesn't mean that there's no truth to be discovered anywhere else, but when it is final truth, especially truth as concerning God and Jesus and the way of salvation and what God expects of us, you don't need any other source. And don't rely on any other source except to the degree that it points you to the truth of the Bible or is compatible with the truth of the Bible. So when it comes to experiences, experience is an important part of life and walking with God. And the joys that you feel and the sorrows that you feel and the repentance that you feel. And sometimes people even have visions or maybe they'll have a visit from an angel or an experience of an angel at work in their life. And all those experiences, some of them may be very real, but they do not substitute or have the same standing as the once for all word of God. And some people say, well, I, I'm not going to believe something that's just written down. I want God to talk to me. Maybe you've seen the meme. I wish God would speak to me. And the answer is, read your Bible. No, I mean, I wish he would speak to me out loud. Read your Bible out loud. <laughs> well, you know, there's other things that may confirm or help us, but the Bible is the standard. What about other books? Other books have been written. There's certainly no lack of attempts to add to the Bible. Muhammad said that the Old and New Testament writings were true. He hadn't read them, but he considered them to be true and um, just thought that if they disagreed with him, they'd been corrupted over time. But he added the Quran, another book, to the Bible. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, um, claimed to have been given the Book of Mormon by an angel. And so, again, you're going to take the Old and the New Testament. Yeah, those are part of the Bible. They belong. And now I'm going to add this book as well. And when there's a discrepancy, you always rejigger your interpretation of the Bible to fit the Book of Mormon. And 
You have others who added to the Bible. Um, Ellen White's writings added um, very much in the Seventh-day Adventist tradition. You listen to what Ellen White wrote um, and give it a very high level of authority. Uh, Mary Baker Eddy's writings became very authoritative for Christian scientists. So there's this sense that, okay, the Bible's good, but we're going to add to it. No. The Bible says every word of God is flawless. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Another place to look for final truth is sacred tradition. And that's a very common and popular approach uh, of the Roman Catholic Church where sacred tradition has a standing equal to that of the Bible itself. And so, for instance, um, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary or the doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope were part of Catholic tradition, and therefore they are um, considered to be absolute truth at the level of the Bible because at some point a church council or a church authority said so. Sorry, that doesn't cut it. Um, and so we need to recognize that the Bible alone is the final truth. And more commonly nowadays, people aren't always looking to other books or to sacred tradition. They're just looking to modern ideas or postmodern ideas and to whatever expert happens to be floating around lately. So it's the Bible, you know, if you're a Christian, it's the Bible plus science. There are some who talk about the two books. The Bible's one book and science is the other book. They might even refer to the Belgian Confession, which is a great Reformation confession, which at one point says creation is like a splendid book. Well, to say something is like a splendid book as a passing metaphor in showing the beauty of God is not the same as saying, and science books are on the same level as the Bible. They are not. Those science books change. And I'm not knocking science. It's, it's, it's very nature that it changes and that the Bible is a once for all revelation. You don't do the Bible plus science or the Bible plus psychology or the Bible plus sociology or the Bible plus feminism or the Bible plus Marxist liberation theology, or the Bible plus critical theory. That's, that's what I'm going to take as my standard. You take the Bible as your standard, and everything else gets evaluated by that standard. The final authority is the Bible alone, not the Bible plus science, not the Bible plus psychology, not the Bible plus sociology, not the Bible plus critical theory, not the Bible plus whatever favorite opinion you've been reading lately on the internet, although the internet is always right, but where else is final truth? It is very, very important that we don't look elsewhere for final truth. We can look elsewhere for truth on some matters. If you want to know how to fix your dryer, get it on YouTube. The Bible will not tell you. Remember what we said about the purpose of the Bible. There's some things the Bible isn't telling you, it's not um, trying to tell you. So don't go to the Bible for answers to everything. Um, go to it for answers for the big questions, how to be right with God, how to be saved, uh, how to live a life that's pleasing to God. Um, feel free to Google or check out YouTube for certain answers on other matters. But for these matters of final truth, the Bible is the only authority. And given that it's the only authority that we can't add to God's word, then what changes if we trust the Bible? Well, we've already seen that we're alive forever in Jesus Christ. If we hear the gospel that the Bible gives us, the gospel of our own sin and of great salvation in Christ, of repentance and turning away from sin and putting our trust in Jesus, then we're alive forever in Jesus. That's a pretty big change from being dead and lost to being God's children and living forever. Another aspect of trusting the Bible is you can hear from God daily. All you've got to do is open your Bible and read it and listen and meditate on it and then talk to God um, and then pray to God. Put it, into, put it into practice. But walking with God daily, that's what changes if you trust the Bible. If you really believe what the Bible says about itself and what we've been saying about the Bible, then you're not going to let it collect dust. You're going to go to it expecting and wanting to hear the voice of God. And you will. And you'll experience the presence of God. And you'll learn to hear from God and to talk with God and have a, a relationship where you're talking to God and listening to Him repeatedly. 
And what else changes? Well, what did, what did the apostle say? The man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You're going through this training and this correcting and this learning, and it's all so that you're able to live a life that more and more reflects God's will for you. More and more, you're maturing in God's mission for you. God has a mission for each one of us, and he's equipping us for that mission with his instructions in the scriptures that we may get to know him better and understand better how to live for him and serve him. And so when, what changes? Well, think of some of the pictures of the Bible. The Bible is a light on your path, so instead of walking in darkness, you can see where you're going. The Bible is like food, and so instead of starving, you're well fed. The Bible is like a sword, so instead of being defenseless, you can defend yourself against the devil, as Jesus did by quoting the scriptures. And in so many other ways, you are equipped for impact to change the world you live in. And if you just do a quick study of church history, you will find that the churches and individuals who strayed away from the Bible were people who ended up not making a positive impact for the Lord. And that those who stuck to the Bible and held firm even in the toughest times, they're like those Bible writers themselves. When others fell away, they stood strong, and in hindsight, it turned out that they were right. And when you hold to the truth of God, even when it's not very popular, you will be vindicated. On that final day when you stand before God and you built your life on Jesus and on the word of God, you will not be shaken. Scripture itself says God is going to shake the earth and the heavens so that only what cannot be shaken will remain. What can't be shaken? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And he says, heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will never pass away. Oh, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you that you have given it to us in our own words, that we can grasp and understand and know something of your wonderful being and your wonderful ways of your son our savior and of the path you mark out for us lord help us to walk that path of life and we pray that we will be more and more confident in your word and that more and more we will not just be hearers of the word but doers as well i pray in jesus name amen